In today's video, I want to present a simple reason why they cannot be three-dimensional complex numbers. So this video was inspired by a um, much more complex and elaborate video by uh, Michael Penn, who's got a very nice math channel. It will be, uh, it will be a link to the video uh, that I'm talking about below, where he makes a very uh, elaborate argument using abstract algebra as to why when you go from certain structures, certain algebras that have certain properties, you can start from the real numbers, you go to the complex numbers, and then you skip to the quaternions, which are four-dimensional, and then you get the octonions and other structures. But you can look at the video if you want all the details, but the reason, in fact, is that um, it, we don't have three-dimensional complex numbers because there is some multiplication that cannot be defined, and that's a simple argument as to why this specific case of three-dimensional complex numbers don't exist. So what do I mean by three-dimensional complex numbers? So the idea is that we all know that we can represent some numbers as real numbers, and we represent them on a line. So we have the 0, 1, e, pi, and so on. Now, you can approach complex numbers in two different ways, and basically they're kind of equivalent, but the complex numbers are defined when we try to solve equations of the form x squared equals minus one. So this doesn't have any real solution, and we introduce some number, which we will call i. So that satisfies i squared equals minus one. And from that, we can write numbers that include a real part and a complex part. So they have a real part length. A plus B times I. So A and B are real numbers. And we represent them in a plane. Like we have the complex plane here, where you have the real part on this axis, and the imaginary part on this axis. So here we have the number 1, here we have the number i, here we have the number minus i, and minus 1. One interesting property here is that when you multiply something by i, you rotate it 90 degrees in the complex plane. So rotations can be represented as multiplication. That's a very interesting property. And it's also interesting that with the complex numbers, you take two numbers, basically a two-dimensional vector, but you perform algebraic calculation using the, 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 the laws we use to, to use for uh, real numbers. So instead of having to deal with two different numbers and remembering the way to combine them, we just combine them in a specific manner, and then we can use ordinary algebra and a lot of the properties that we're used to. Now, what would be very interesting, it would be to have 3D complex numbers, because if we can do a lot of calculations in a plane, we live in a three-dimensional world, it would be very interesting if we could have the same trick, and instead of having to use three numbers to represent the position of a, any object in space, and then track these numbers and do the calculations that we, we're used to doing them, we could instead have a single number, which would represent all three dimensions. But unfortunately, that will not work. So the trendy big complex numbers don't exist. And why don't they exist? Well, let's say we want to define one such number. So we would put, we would add a form A plus b times i, so it would include the complex numbers because we want to expand on what we already know. And we have another part uh, with another coordinate c, and we will give it the, num the letter j to represent the third dimension. So if we look at this, we would have... So we'd have the, the real numbers here, and the i-axis and the j-axis. And to keep our analogy with the, uh, the complex numbers, what we would really like to do is to have j squared equals minus 1. So why do we want that? Because 
we know that multiplying by i will rotate us 90 degrees. So if we rotate by 90 degrees once, 90 degrees twice, then uh, we get to minus 1. We would like to have the same property in the j-axis so that if we start with the real numbers and we multiply by j, we get the number j and if we multiply again by j, we get to minus 1 so that the nice properties that we had before the co that made the complex numbers very useful are still present. Well, unfortunately, that will not work and that's what we'll see on the next board. Okay. We've been trying to define three-dimensional complex numbers having the form a plus i times b plus j times c and a, b and c are real numbers. Unfortunately, we will run into a problem when we try to define i times g. We know that we want i squared to be minus 1 and j squared to be minus 1 also. But if we want to multiply these numbers together, let's say we have two numbers of this form, eventually we will have to multiply i by g and we have to decide what this number will be. So let's give it a try. Can we have i times j equals 1? Or minus 1, it doesn't matter, we'll see why. Well, okay, that's a possibility. i times j equals 1 or minus 1 or any real number for that matter. Well, what we can do is we will multiply by i on each side of this equation. So we have i times i times j equals i. And we know that i squared is minus 1. So that means that minus j equals i. So if this is true, then minus j must equal to y, to i. Sorry. Well, that's a problem because we want i, j, and the real numbers to be in different dimensions. So we shouldn't be able to express j in terms of i. That doesn't work because then we don't have three dimensions. We really only have two dimensions because we can express this one in terms of the other one. Okay, so i times j equals 1 doesn't work. Let's say if we can have i times j equals i. Well, now you will see the trick. Uh, we use the same trick each time. We will multiply by something to get a square, and that square will be equal to minus 1, and we will get to a contradiction. So here, uh, we can multiply by i on both sides. i times i times j equals i times i. So that means this is minus 1, this is minus 1, and that means that j equals 1. Once again, that doesn't work because what we want to do is to have three different uh, axes that are orthogonal to each other, that cannot be expressed in terms of each other. So j equals 1 if i times j equals i. Okay, doesn't work, so let's give it a try for the, uh, the last possibility that we could think of. That would be reasonable. And you see, by the way, that if you could i times j equals any real number, this one was replaced by 5, for example. Well, then we will keep the 5 all around, and at the end, if this is 5, minus g will be equals to uh, 5 times i. So we would keep the i along the calculations, and it still doesn't work. So it, you just have to do one case of each to see that it cannot be that, you know, on that general axis. So i times g equals j. Here, we want to get rid of this j, so what we'll do is, uh, or we can even we may multiply by a j on each side. So i times j times j equals j times j. So I'm multiplying on the right here and I'm multiplying on the left here because maybe these numbers i and j don't commute. Because when you get to the quaternions, I haven't mentioned it, but it's not a video about the quaternions, the higher dimensions don't commute 
together the anti-commute. So i times j equals minus j times i with the quaternion. So we don't know if this is the case here, and we don't want to assume that there will be commutativity between i and j. So we just keep it very clean and multiply by j on the right this time. Uh, we could preserve associativity because uh, otherwise we will lose a lot and we won't be able to do the calculations that we want to do. So if associativity is not uh, assumed with this algebra, then all the calculations we, we want to do uh, with these numbers to help us, uh, which would be one of the reasons why we would want to use these numbers, these three-dimensional complex numbers, is to take uh, geometry in 3D and bring it back to algebraic calculations. That won't work either. So we will assume that this is associative, so that i j times j is equal to i times j times j. And if you want to have all the details of how this works, you can look at the, the, the video I mentioned before, the Michael Penn video. So i times j times j equals j times j. Once again, this is minus one, this is minus one. So we would have i equals to 1, which is not true, i is not equal to 1, because it's on a different dimension. Okay, and uh, now we will say, well, okay, we cannot have i times a equals 1, i or j, can it be equal to any arbitrary number? Well, that won't work either. Uh, I'm sure it for the sake of, sake of completeness, because here, uh, I think that all the reasonable assumptions have been made, and if this doesn't work, it's very unlikely that we will be able to have practical results that will be helpful uh, or that would make sense. But for the sake of completeness, on the next board, I'll show what happens if we uh, set uh, i times j equals any arbitrary number. Okay, so now we want to see if we can define i times j as to any arbitrary linear combination of the real part, the i part, and the j part. And to do that, we would to see if this works or not, uh, we would simply uh, try to get to a contradiction like we did with the uh, on the other board. So uh, let's say, let's see what I, what did I do? I will multiply by j on both sides, for example. So let's say I have i j equals a plus i b plus j times c, and we want to determine what these a b and c could be, so that th this works. And so we can multiply by well, we can multiply by i, anything will do. i times ij equals to ai plus, well, i times ib would be minus b plus i times g, g um, times c. Now, this is minus 1, minus j, equals that to a i minus b plus then what is i times j? Well, it's a plus i b plus j c, so it would be c times a plus i b plus j c. So far we just took our hypothesis, we used it, we multiplied by i on both sides, reinserted the value of i times j, and now we want to see if we can get a, b, and c. So how are we going to do that? What we want, as uh, you can recall, is we want to have three different axes that are orthogonal to each other, that are independent from each other, the real, the high part, and the j part. So what we do, if these two things are equal, then each part must be equal, like, uh, like with the complex numbers. Two e complex numbers are equal to each other if their real part is equal to their, to their real parts are equal to each other, and the imaginary parts are equal to each other. So we're going to do the same. Uh, okay, so after multiplying this, we have, let's say, the j part here. And we get three equations. The j part here is minus 1, and there is no j part, there is no j part, and the j part here will be equal to c squared j. So minus 1 equals c squared. And then uh, now we, we have a big problem. Because we want these ABCs to be part of the real numbers. But C squared equals minus 1 doesn't have a solution in the real numbers. C must be imaginary. 
And that's where we get a contradiction and once again. It doesn't work. So basically, the reason why we cannot have numbers of the form a plus ib plus jc with a squared, uh, sorry, i squared and j squared equals minus one that are like the complex numbers but in three dimensions is because we cannot reasonably define the product i times j while keeping a lot of the properties that we want these numbers to have so that we can use them. And that's it for today.